to get started. And uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for a, a hot August night. Uh, this is a great turnout. And uh, thank you very much on the behalf of the Comas Area Civic Association. We would like to thank you uh, for being here. Um, to start off tonight's program, I'm going to ask John Faxon if he'll lead us all in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Yes, with honor. I'll stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much, John. All right, on uh, behalf of NACA, I'd like to introduce a couple of people to you. One of our board members whom you met when you first checked in, Vicki ProVenture. Vicki, if you'll identify yourself. You bad, everybody. Oh, she's wonderful. Right next to her is Patrick McCarthy. Patrick writes our waterways reports in our newsletters that you receive. Um, where is Bruce Dillon? Bruce, I don't know you. Oh, he, oh, he did? Okay. Bruce just stepped down. We'll get and hand anyway. You bet. Bruce, um, anybody from this area uh, knows Bruce and how much of an asset he is for, for the Congress and Sarasota County uh, in addition to. Um, we've got one other board member, he, I just got a text from him, he's on his way, Victor Bagnardi, and he'll be here shortly. And I am Bill Cantrell, if we have not met, uh, come get me afterwards, and I'd love to meet you. Um, so thank you for being here. All right, raise your hands. How many new members tonight? Wow, that's awesome. Great. How many people here for the first time did have to be a member? Love it. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. Okay, a couple of, uh, quick announcements before we get, uh, we've got a full night. But um, over the summer, we've been working for uh, a new logo and a tagline for NACA. And we came up with a tagline of um, causes that matter, people that care is our new tagline. And uh, if you've got one of the newsletters that we passed out or mailed to you. We've got the new logo on the corner. Granted, this one's in black and white, but I want to give a great big shout out to a gentleman that is a resident of Nokomis. His name is Brandon, uh, Brandon uh, Kudal. Kudal? Wait. Nicole. I'm butchering it. Kudal. Kudal. Thank you. His wife, uh, uh, Nicole, was here in the audience. Brendan couldn't be here, but he might be here later. But he did this and the generosity of his heart and uh, just for support of NACA. And we can't be happier and thank Brendan for that hard work. And uh, yeah, he really turned out very, very nice. And uh, he's got, so if you've got uh, needs for any graphic arts uh, work, or he's even got some of his own artwork, He's got his own website, and it's just his name. It's www.brendan.com. And go, he's got a great website, and uh, got some fun stuff there. And uh, like Paradise Grill, you know, the, uh, the logo and the t-shirts, he did that for Mary Beth at Paradise Grill, I know. But he's done a bunch of stuff here locally, and uh, uh, couldn't say enough thanks. Uh, for that. So thank you, Brendan. Okay, then I got a contact the other day for there is a long range transportation plan that a general survey to our area, to our community, is taking place right now. And if you are a member of NACA and we have your email address, we're going to send this information out to you this week uh, where you can take a survey and they're looking for what you feel like for the next 25 years are our pri for our community the priorities that uh, we need. And we're going to give you a link where you can go online and do the survey. And if you don't uh, have an email, if we don't have your email address, 
come see me after tonight's meeting and I'll give you the, uh, the email address and the link for that. Um, but that, so we all, I know we complain, especially in the, in, during the season, about the traffic. So here's your chance to let them know what you really think. Um, but it doesn't say anything about profanity, so, but I still, I would believe that. Event <laughs> that. But a uh, couple things that we're really excited about. We've got a first annual Historic Nokomis Day coming up November the 2nd, which is a Saturday. And um, there's, there's two purposes for the, the event. Number one is to bring our community together. And uh, we've got this wonderful facility right here, beautiful park behind us, backs right up the Legacy Trail. You've got kayak launch right here on the waterway. And um, we're going to have John McCarthy, whom you're going to meet tonight, if you haven't already met John. He's a local historian. He'll be doing seminars in this room during the day for that. And then we've got Sheriff Knight is going to bring his equestrian patrol team with the horses out here. He's going to bring the SWAT team with all their toys. They're going to set up a obstacle course for the kids to play through. We've got Friends of Legacy Trail that we're going to do a bicycle rodeo and they're going to give the first hundred kids free safety helmets. So that's pretty nice. Um, but I'm, the Sarasota County Parks and Rec are going to bring some inflatables out here for us. We'll have a DJ uh, out here playing music. We'll have uh, lunch. It's going to go from 10 until about 2 o'clock. We'll have lunch and we are looking for some sponsorship. So if you know someone, have an end with someone, if you have some kindness out of your heart that you would like to be participating in, we would love to speak with you. Um, Silent Sports Outfitters, which is right up here in the Comas, they do the kayaks. We're going to have them set up right back here along the water. They'll be doing the kayak seminars back there. We just got a huge announcement last week. Sarasota Memorial Hospital has made a very generous donation for this event that uh, we uh, are very excited about. And um, if you've got the newsletter that you grab, uh, I've got some more information about that. I also forgot, uh, the Combs Volunteer Fire Department's gonna have the big truck out here for the kids. So it's gonna be a great family day. You're gonna get to learn more about the Combs that you didn't know. We're going to get to raise money for underprivileged local children to attend Sarasota County Park and Rec Summer Camp. It's an eight-week program next summer. They've given NACA a reduced rate for scholarships for the kids. We just felt like that if we can get a child in an eight-week program during the summer, that where they're fed a hot meal during the day and for eight hours while the parents are at work or the parents at work, if we can put them in a structured program, not only does the child benefit, but we all benefit. And uh, that's the, the second big takeaway from, from the event that we're doing. So we, uh, we're looking for uh, you know, money to, to, uh, for the event, but we're also looking for donations for scholarships as well. So enough of that. If you'd like to volunteer, or if you'd like to write a check, or you know somebody that you can tap on the shoulder for us for a check, come see me. Thank you on that. Um, then we have, um, some of you have uh, been very, I want to brag on some folks. We, uh, you know, Nokomis is unincorporated. We kind of have to look after ourselves here. And that's one of the general purposes of, of NACA, is uh, we're kind of to help be the voice uh, to the, uh, to back to the county. And um, we've got a group of people that uh, are here locally, and I just, I can't say enough good about what they've been able to do. And uh, they've got a, a group that's called Stop the Swap. And um, Gary and Laurel Bookhart, I'd like for you to stand and just identify yourselves. And then Shelly, is Joe here? Shelly, you stand up. This is Shelly Martini. 
And um, this uh, is Marianne and Seth Hill here? No? Okay. How about Jenny and Steve? Are they here? No? Okay. Anyway, there's a, a, a nice group, but these folks, um, they've put together a neighborhood coalition that where there's um, a piece of property that's adjacent to this neighborhood that is going up before the, um, the county to be rezoned. And um, these folks have done just a tremendous job. Uh, they went before the planning commissioners back in June and um, the planning commissioners unanimously denied um, the uh, going forward now. That doesn't mean that it's over. The um, owners of the property, they get to go before the Board of County Commissioners. And so if anybody's been following that, the, um, the date that, that go before the Board of County Commissioners it was September. It's now been moved to October the 8th at 1.30 at the South County building. So um, if you're interested in that, um, it'll be on October the 8th, um, sometime after 1.30, South County. So, but great job with that, guys and ladies. It's been tremendous. Um, Sarasota Memorial Hospital update. As you know, NACA was invited to be on the Neighborhood Advisory Council to Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Vicki ProVenture represents NACA on that, and uh, she's doing a great job. And she got to go shovel dirt when they broke ground on that uh, back early in the summer. And uh, the, let's see, back in June, Vitis City Council gave unanimous support to go forward with that, which we were grateful for that. And that has received some feedback about um, water drainage concerns. They've been identified, they'll be addressed. And Sarasota County is going to handle the sewer, the wastewater temporarily. The uh, Venice will run a pipe underneath 75 across the, the interstate to their wastewater afterwards. But uh, the county's going to take over immediately and then uh, Venice will come on the back side of that. But other than that, I mean, they are working like crazy over there. I, I mean, I go by every day and it's amazing what they do um, each day. So, um, and you know, there's one last thing. I forgot to, uh, we, we've got a celebrity in the house. How many in here have a building named after themselves. We've got a person here that, that does. That uh, that I'm going to tell you has been just a champion for our community. Sandra Terry, Sandra, stand up for us, please. You can do what you've done for how many years? Sandra, how many years? How many years? 30 years, folks. So Sandra just retired. God bless you. How many years? That's awesome. Okay, um, that's enough for me. And last, if I can give away something, I'd like to do that. Ladies, do y'all have the uh, the y'all tickets? And then, She's the owner of Paradise Grill. If y'all haven't met her, you need to because she is a tremendous asset for our community. She runs a wonderful business. She does a lot of things that she does behind the scenes for our community that uh, most wouldn't know, but I do. And uh, she's been a big supporter for NACA. And each meeting, she always gives and donates a gift certificate for, to her restaurant. And not only that, she came up to me the other day and she said, I want to get involved with uh, Historic Nokomis Day in November. I said, well, you just let me know what you want to do. She said, well, I want to do um, 
shaved ice for everybody, the, the snow cones. And she said, but that's just, I want to do something else. I said, well, you think about what you want to do. But she's already um, volunteered for that. And uh, thank you very much. so much content it was like drinking from a fire hose it was just tremendous in the amount of, of speakers that they had and um, afterwards I, uh, I was really taken by that and I thought you know there are a lot of folks in there were about seven or eight hundred people that attended that but I know that especially with Nokomis being so much water around us that um, I thought that it would be great for our community to learn more and hear some of the the, um, the facts that uh, um, these speakers had. And uh, if some of y'all remember Paul Harvey, well, we're going to get the rest of the story tonight, too. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to bring up John McCarthy, and John's going to MC the rest of the evening for us. And I just I can't thank you for doing putting this together, John. Thank you, John. So uh, Bill, Bill reached out to me by phone and uh, we started talking about what we could do here uh, for the Comas Area Civic Association. Uh, talked about a couple of people who we wanted to have in the room with us and so uh, you're going to have an opportunity to hear from four different uh, speakers here tonight. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a presentation then we're going to get into the question and answers. Uh, that's my slow voice. Okay. <laughs> So a um, couple of things uh, Bill and I talked about leading up to this. One is that, you know, I'll, I'll put this in the form of a question. How many of us uh, have a home on a septic system? Quite a few. So one of the questions I asked myself in this whole question of water quality, because it seems like the septic is bad and somehow sewer is good, although then I see the sewer lines break and they spill lots of stuff. Whereas my little septic has only got like my stuff, you know. But, but it causes me to wonder, are some things that I could be doing uh, as I live my life and use that system that would uh, have that system be healthier for the community? So hopefully tonight we're going to hear a little bit about, I know we are, going to hear a little bit about septic systems, some of the current thoughts, some of the future stuff that's out there, and some real practical stuff. Um, and then the other thing I think is important is that um, and we're going to see this here in a moment when I get into the slides. Um, folks, we got a problem. Would you all agree? Oh, yeah. We have a problem. We have a big problem. My wife doesn't want to go swimming in the Gulf of Mexico anymore. Now, I don't know if that's because of the fecal coliform or the flesh-eating disease, but it's cramping my style. I grew up, spent my whole life in Florida. Swimming in the Gulf is one of the main things that I want to do when I'm not at work. So the fact that she doesn't want to go caused me to realize we got a problem. And uh, at any rate, let me get into these slides. So last night I got the idea. What if I were to compare headlines from 100 years ago to the last two weeks? So that's what I did. So I reached for some old newspaper articles that I had in my collection. And then I grabbed my recycle bin that had not been out there yet. And I put this slideshow together. And then I got a little carried away and I decided I would uh, put some other stuff in there. I want to tell you folks that for 5,000 years, Native Americans lived here and apparently had no water quality issues. In fact, they got the benefit of all the great water quality we had 
And they actually had all these shells, the shellfish, the, the big clams and the oysters and the whelks and the conchs, and they made tools and jewelry out of them, and they, they stacked up the shells. These shells that they were working with thousands of years ago, if you compare these shells to the shells we have out there now, it's like totally different shells. Like the, the shell of these lightning whelks will be like a quarter inch thick. And you go out and look at a lightning whelk now, and it's like a sixteenth of an inch thick. So what changed? What changed? And then, and then they, they had enough shells that there's entire civilization of thousands of people could live here for thousands of years, and they made these big piles out of the shells. So that does not come from a bad water quality situation. Let me back up. I'm talking too fast. At the Sarasota County Water Quality Summit, about midway through the day, a gentleman walked up to me and said he just come to Sarasota the week before, just moved to town, he said, what did it used to be like, John? And then all these other people kept asking me, so this slide shows the answer to that question. So here, here's a big old shell mound with a road cut through it in Sarasota. Uh, and so just, you know, hundreds of years of being able to coexist. This is where you can come to historic Spanish Point, where I work, and see a thousand years of history. You can look at these shells, you can practically touch them, and you can see the tremendous uh, diversity of marine shells that we have, the health of them, how big they are. You should see the scallops they were eating a thousand years ago. It's amazing. And then the, the Cuban fishermen came up from, from Cuba, and, and they started catching fish, like from the 1750s to the 1850s, and they just caught fish after fish after fish, and they're living in these little um, palm thatch huts, just like the Seminole Indians and just like all the tiki bars around town. You know, that's where they got this from. So then Sarasota, from its earliest days, promoted itself as a fishing paradise. So we got a photograph of guys over here with a bunch of fish and guys up here catching fish and an article about all the great fishing and all the different type of fish that you can catch here. So back in the day, there was no lack of fish. Again, we have excellent water quality. And here's a little directory. I don't know how well y'all can see all this stuff. This is 1897. This is a little clip on Venice. And it says that Venice is a great place to go fishing. And there's a little clip on Osprey. And it says Osprey is a great place to go fishing. And if we could read those people's names, we'd see that a lot of them are fisher folks. So this is how people earn a living. Here's an article about kingfish in the bay. This guy, he caught 47 kingfish. Uh, let's see, 16 boats went out. This other boat caught 200 pounds of kingfish. On Tuesday, and this is like 1911, it is estimated that 2,500 pounds of kingfish was caught by the folks that went out fishing that day. Now, I'm not saying that they weren't overfishing. Seems to me like maybe they were, but there was a lot of fish out there. How about this one on the left? Ten boxcar loads of fish shipped out of Sarasota. This is 1911. Wow. Ten boxcar loads of fish, and that happened almost <laughs> every day. And they describe it as mullet and other fish. So they weren't wasting everything. They were selling it. Uh, let's see. Here's one. These people are talking about a school of fish they estimated was 250,000 pounds worth of fish. They were able to catch about 25,000 pounds of it. These other guys come along and caught 20,000 pounds of it. Another guy came and caught 17,000 pounds from the same school of fish. Again, not saying we weren't doing a little bit of overfishing. Uh, and then best catches, here's the Sarasota Fish and Oyster Company. For five days, they've shipped 215,000 pounds of mullet and mixed fish out of Sarasota. Same was true of the Venice area, by the way. Uh, and then, uh, oh, look at this one, a new fishing boat. They had to build a new fishing boat, a bigger boat that would hold 25,000 pounds worth of fish because that's what they expected they had to haul every day. And it wasn't just commercial fishing, it was fishing, uh, sports fishing. So here's a headline for you, had good luck fishing. When was the last time you saw that headline, right? Okay, we're gonna look at headlines in a minute here, folks. And then this one I thought is pretty cool, so I highlighted it. And it talks about uh, an old place down here called the Moss Oak House, and they're spending their time oystering, fishing, and clamming. When was the last time you left oystering in, in Roberts Bay, Curry Creek, Sarasota Bay? 65 years ago. 65 years ago. Scallops. Do we hear an amen? <laughs> so, scallops, and they've been gone for a while now. And here's just a little shot. This is uh, George, uh, a guy named uh, Foreman up in Sarasota, loaned me these photos years ago so I could take some pictures of them. And then uh, 
Here's an article about oysters. Somebody asked me once, John, did oysters ever grow in the bay? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, here's one. It talks about 290 acres of oysters under lease. And this is all over. So this is Whitaker up on the north side of town, a guy named Thomas Wooster out on Bird Key. And then you look down there, you get to Mrs. Palmer. Mrs. Palmer had like uh, 104 uh, acres that she had under lease, and then the Roberts and some of these other folks. Oysters were abundant all over the place. And then how about this one? Uh, these guys, Williams and Tuttle and French, they go out in the, in the Sarasota uh, Bay, and they catch a... Uh, a uh, six foot long, 450 pound bass. It sure was some bass. Yeah, that sure was. And then here's another great headline over here. I know it's hard for y'all to read. I'm sorry about the fine print. Uh, fine catch of fish, and it goes on and on about that. So, and then how about this one? 45,000 pounds of fish shipped to northern states the last three days of the last week. And there's the old railroad dock in Sarasota where they just load the fish right up under the boxcar, take it up north. So here's a little launch called the Kitty. And they took this boat like eight miles out into the Gulf and they brought back 123 fish that weighed in an aggregate over 700 pounds. A uh, picture of the fish was made at the Bellhaven Inn. So there it is. By the way, for those of you familiar with historic Spanish Point, we have a boat called the Magic, right? It's just like the Kitty. They took the kitty out eight miles into the Gulf of Mexico without a radio or anything. Think about that for a minute. That's pretty cool. I think we should take magic out there. So here's a photograph from the Bellhaven Inn. So now we don't have to believe the newspaper articles. We can look at the photographs themselves, right? So here's one out at the Bay Island Hotel. These guys are proud of their catch. Here's one. Uh, Tucker's Sporting Goods had this thing downtown it, it, to hang the fish on. It said, Tucker's Tackle takes them. <laughs> All right, here's, uh, here's this guy, um, Worthy Stanford. He ran a hotel down in the south end of Minnesota Key in Inglewood. He's got his fishing boat out there, a bunch of fish that one of his little guests caught there. And uh, he seems so proud of himself, he named his boat after himself. <laughs> and then this is a postcard I just bought off of eBay. I paid more for it than just about any other postcard I've ever bought on eBay. Look at it, it's an oarfish, eight foot, two inches long. Look at it laid out on the sidewalk there. And again, just to kind of show that we were like a paradise, you know. You never knew what you were going to pull up out of the Gulf of Mexico or out of the bay. And here again, you can see Tucker's tackle takes them up there, right out there in front of Tucker's Sporting Goods. Here's a photograph down at the Venice Inlet, right where the crow's nest is now, showing some of the fishing boats. So fishing was a big deal. Here's how they promoted the state of Florida. The governor of Florida said, everybody come here to go fishing. He's not saying everybody come here because there's poop in the water. He said, come here to go fishing. Right? And then here's Sarasota's old slogan. It's always fishing time in Sarasota County. And I was kind of happy to see that it says down here, Venice area included as well in the fine print. All right? Nokomis isn't mentioned, but hey, they, they got Venice in there. And so then two months ago, uh, I get involved in this water quality summit all day long, six, seven hundred people, as was previously discussed. But since then, the headlines have been unbelievable. So here's one, Port Charlotte woman gets flesh-eating bacteria in foot at popular Florida beach. Now that's on Minnesota Key. You heard about the one on Anna Maria, did you hear about the one on Minnesota Key? How about this one? No swim advisory issued for Sarasota County beaches the day before 4th of July? Really? Serious? And then look at this article out of the Orlando newspaper. And now let me read this one to you. Happy 4th of July, Florida. Three beaches are closed for the long weekend because of poop water. And all three of them are in Sarasota County. That's what the Orlando newspaper is saying about us. How about this one, the blue-green algae down in St. Lucie? That's on the East Coast. And then Gary Seidman writes about this water quality issue in the Herald Tribune. And then here's an interesting headline, Red Tide versus Task Force. You know, it's like... Something's got to give. And then we got this surge of sea turtles. So we're one of like the only places on the west coast of Florida where the sea turtles come to breed, and yet we're messing things up. How about this one? Spill anchors siesta because they had a big sewage spill in the Grand Canal. Right? They're eager to see changes after the sewer spill. But these things seem to keep happening. Here's a sewer spill. This one's fascinating. A contractor working for a developer cuts a hole in a county pipe located within the city of Venice. 
<laughs> what more need I say? Four and then, you know, a couple days later, Venice is talk sewage option. Now, folks, these are newspapers literally pulled out of my recycle bin last night for the last two weeks. And then, and then the Longboat Observer, you know, red tide got you down. And then what about Ross Camp Institute? You know, they're the big brain people here in, in the area. They're like one of the leading authorities of brains. They're saying the red tide affects your brain. And then what about this? Last night there was a seminar on water quality. Tonight there's this summit. And tomorrow there's another one. And there's Steve Swa, one of our panelists tonight, going to get involved tomorrow night. So three nights of water quality stuff. Pretty amazing. Where are we going from here? That's what we're here to talk about tonight. Anyway, that's my introduction, folks. <laughs> time to get started with somebody else besides me. And uh, I want to introduce Dr. Abby Turner. And Dr. Abby is the Water Resources Agent for UF um, University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, what's called UF IFAS. Um, and she also works with Extension and Sustainability in Sarasota County. She received her PhD in Geography from Penn State, where her research focused on quantifying the changes to wetland hydro patterns as a result of human disturbance. <laughs> Abby has been working on various water resource issues since coming back to Florida in 2016. She is a Florida gal. And everything from micropollution to water conservation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Abby Turner. <laughs> So I was at the Water Quality Summit too last night in Lee County, and it was awesome. Um, definitely worth the time. Um, they showed the film Troubled Water, which was put together by Clues Waterkeeper. Very interesting. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about tonight. I've been asked to talk about septic tanks. So I think John already asked you, how many of you have septic tanks? All right, great. Um, so I hope that this information is helpful. What I did is I polled people about septic tanks and I found out what their commonly misheld myths or misconceptions are. And um, I'm going to talk about those tonight. But before I do, keeping with John's history, so if you were to step off into Sarasota County in 1948, this is what you would see. And you're like, wait, what is that? Can someone turn down the lights for me too, please? Thank you. That's the other direction. Down. Yeah, sorry. Perfect. Okay. So can you see all the black stuff? The black dots. Do you guys know what those are? Okay. They're wetlands. So what you're seeing is actually water coming to the surface. Okay, so those are all wetlands. And that's Sarasota County. You can see the Lower Mackle River, I'm sorry, the Lower Mackle Lake and the river on the right side. And then on the left side, you see Little Sarasota Bay. So currently, we're located south of this picture. But if I would have zoomed south, you would have seen the same thing. So in 1948, um, when you would get to Sarasota County, you would see lots of wetlands. I think this shows a lot of things. One, it shows that the way we've drained our land certainly changed since then, right? And two, it shows, man, that water table's really at the surface, isn't it? So think about that when we think about septic tanks. Water table at the surface and lots of septic tanks. And I'll show you that in just a second. So I think we're all here because we have impaired water. So impaired water just basically means that they don't meet their designated use as fishable and swimmable, as John mentioned. So um, we want to um, improve our waters. And so doing that, one first step is education. So thanks for being here, great job. So you can see these are just nutrient impaired waters. So these are waters that are impaired for either nitrogen or phosphorus. And where we're sitting at locally right now is impaired, um, the Bay local is impaired for its nitrogen. And so at University of Florida, in order to help residents understand their septic tanks a little bit more, and also so that we can um, work with residents more to improve their septic tanks, University of Florida, um, my colleagues, created a program called After the Flush. So everything that I present tonight is from my colleagues, it's not from my own research. So I can get you in touch with the person who did the research, or I could be a conduit of the information. So I just want you to keep that in mind. 
So they have a great video. I was going to show it, but I'm not because there's no good sound. But I can certainly email it to you. And it's just an overview of the subject system. So you can see the subject system behind, I think his name is Subject Steve. And so behind Subject Steve, um, you can see the house and it has pipes and it's going into something called the subject tank. And so those of you with the subject tank are probably familiar that um, because of different densities of the stuff coming in, you get different stratified layers. So on the bottom, you get the heavy solid stuff. In the middle, you get the liquid stuff. And then at the top, you get something called um, the scum, or it's usually like fats. And so it's the stuff that's buoyant and can float. And so there's a ratio between the amount of stuff on the bottom and the amount of stuff on the top. Think about it like a sandwich, like the yellow layer and the brown layer. That ratio really should dictate when you pump this up. And the water, if I had the video showing, would it continue to rise and then it would flow out of the other side and into your drain field. Wrong way. All right, so how many of these septic tanks do we have in Sarasota County? This is the map of the density of septic tanks. If you see purple, that's a septic tank. And so our area, I don't think this has, does it have a pointer? Oh yeah, it's the lower bump there. Oh yeah, yeah. ooh, you can see how bad I'm shaking. I'm scared. <laughs> okay, so I think we're like, well, I looked it up on the map before I got here. We're right here, right guys? Yeah, we're real close. Yeah. yeah, so we're about right here. So you can see that there's high septic tank density, and the yellow means that that's an impaired water. So just what I mentioned before. So this is an impaired water, and then you can see the septic tank density. And then the gray means it's a city. It's a municipality, so it's not an unincorporated Sarasota County. So some quick facts and figures about septic tanks. There's about 40,000 septic tanks in Sarasota County. 10,000 of them are um, really close to surface water bodies. And um, they do load nutrients into these bays. There's been a proposal. So um, you can look at the um, Board of County Commission's meeting May 8th. On May 8th, uh, Sarasota County staff proposed a bunch of water quality improvement plans. And one of those plans was to replace these septic systems, especially these 10,000 within 900 feet of surface water bodies, and at a price of, and now don't put too much credence into this dollar amount, but just note that it's a lot of money. It's about $150 million to convert those to central sewer. Because in the conversion, you'd also have to increase the capacity of the South Venice Wastewater Treatment Facility. So let's get to the myths and facts. So like I said, I pulled a bunch of people to figure out, like, what do they think about septic? And the first thing that I always get is only leaky septic tanks contribute to nitrogen pollution. And I'm sorry, that's unfortunately not true. All septic tanks actually contribute to nitrogen pollution because septic tanks were actually not designed to capture nitrogen. They were designed to capture bacteria. And thank goodness, they do a really great job of that as long as they are well maintained. But nitrogen, the stuff that's in that water that flows right out, um, that just goes into your drain field. And if you have a high water table, well, it's going right to surface water bodies as well. Does that make sense? So um, how much nitrogen are we talking? Um, well, I'll get to that in just a minute. This is just what I said. So unfortunately, all septic tanks contribute to nutrient pollution. They should be um, maintained annually inspected. They should be pumped out every three to five years. Um, and unfortunately, these conventional systems do not remove nitrogen. So um, the average person on an average day will send 11.2 grams of nitrogen to your septic tank. Okay, and then your septic tank will do its job and hold in the solids, keep the scum, let go of the water, and 7.8 grams of nitrogen per person per day will leave. So there's about a 30%, um, so the septic tank keeps about 30% of the nitrogen, right? So we're talking about grams. When we measure um, nitrogen in water bodies, we usually refer to milligrams per liter. And um, this is just total grams per day. So on average, it's about 16 milligrams per liter. Meanwhile, your conventional central sewer system will put out reclaimed water at about 18 milligrams per liter. So 60 milligrams per liter is what a septic tank is putting out, and 18 is what um, a advanced, not advanced, but tertiary treatment, wastewater treatment um, puts out. Did I use those words correctly? Number two. The more I pump it out, the more I will help improve water quality. Again, that is not true, unfortunately. You should actually not over pump out your tank, even though you want to do an environmental good. It's actually doing your tank that injustice because there's a lot of bacteria in there 
that are helping to break down that biological matter, that muck layer on the bottom. So if you overpump it, you're disturbing those, um, that biology, and you're actually harming instead of um, helping your septic tank. How many people thought that that might be true? Okay, just one. You guys are septic smart. Um, all right, so the other myth is that there are these cleaners on the market. I can just shove a cleaner in my septic tank or down my toilet or a tab in my toilet once a month, and when I do that, bada boom, bada bing, my septic tank is clean. But unfortunately, that's also not true. Um, cleaners, believe it or not, even though they say they are clean, they don't actually clean the tank. Um, they are either not significantly effective or they actually might cause solids to be flushed from the septic into your drain field and cause clogs in your drain field, which is quite a problem because you don't want that to happen. The drain field is where all the magic happens. So you can see a, a diagram of the drain field. So in a traditional septic, you have the septic tank that's attached right to the drain field. But is there additional treatment? So a lot of people think, no, there's not. There's nothing I can do then. I got to just wait till I can get hooked up to central sewer. But indeed, no, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait, I don't have to wait. No one has to wait because there's commercial technologies available. So my colleagues at the University of Florida work with the Department of Health and a bunch of others to do research on advanced wastewater treatment for septic tanks. Um, and so you can use different types of um, passive systems, which I'll show you in just a minute, to help remove nitrogen so that you can decrease the amount of nitrogen from your septic tank from 60 milligrams per liter to like three or four milligrams per liter. So great improvements there. It does cost a lot. It costs between ten and twenty thousand dollars. So that's a lot of money. In the state of Florida, because of um, the springs legislation, which I don't know what the name of that springs legislation is, but if you live in a spring shed that is impaired, so think about Weeki Wachee and Rainbow and other springs like that, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection will actually help pay for this advanced septic tank um, retrofit. That's awesome. Why aren't they helping us to pay for ours since we have so many nutrient pollution issues? So that's something that we want to think about. So this is what it looks like. This is passive nitrogen removal. So you have waste water coming from your home and it goes into the primary septic tank just like normal where everything gets separated and then it goes into this additional stage. So stage one is an unsaturated biofilter, which basically means that it has oxygen. And so in order for nitrogen to go through its cycles and get turned into nitrogen gas, you need to have oxygen and then a no oxygen environment. And so this is exactly what it does. It adds um, oxygen, it's called nitrification, and then it takes away the oxygen in stage two in a saturated filter, which creates denitrification, which is changing that nitrogen into a gas to go back into the atmosphere. And two gas, which is makes up 78% of our atmosphere, right? And then you still have your conventional drain field, but there could be more actually reduction that happens in your drain field as well. I keep going the wrong way. All right, this is my favorite one because I get this a lot. Flushable wipes are actually not flushable. Whether you live with a septic tank or not, they're just not flushable. Unfortunately, products that are marketed as a variety of ways such as septic safe or break down like toilet paper or safe for sewer and septic, they actually aren't safe for sewer or septic. They actually weave together um, with different algaes and um, hopefully not dental floss because it's also terrible to flush, but they weave together with other materials to create great big blockages um, in your pipes. So you want to stick to the three P's of what to flush. You know what the first two are, right? My 11-year-old would shout it. And then the last P is paper. So you want to stick to just the two P's and paper. Now, there's a great video on Be Septic Smart. So this is called the invasion of the fat bird. Because not only should you not flush wipes, but you also shouldn't put down your drain fats, greases, and oils or fogs. So um, there's EPA has do your part, be septic smart, and I have this on the back table, and it tells you all the do's and don'ts of having a septic tank. So do not flush wipes, do not put down fats, oils, and greases, um, do not park on your drain field. That causes compaction, and then you no longer have those soils that are supposed to do all of the um, 
heavy lifting as far as biogeochemistry is concerned. Um, also, try to think about reducing your total water use. So not put so much wear and tear on your septic system. And um, that's it. Do you have any questions or are not supposed to take questions yet? Not yet. All right, not yet. Just wait right there. Oh, but before I go, I also have two other things. Just a general overview of septic systems, if you want to read more about them. And then nitrogen, um, how nitrogen is worked within your septic system and advanced septic systems. So thank you. All right, let's hear it. It earlier, but what we're going to do this evening so that we can optimize our time and cover all the questions, we, we have distributed some 3 by 5 cards. We also have some fancy pens, courtesy of Gulf Coast Community Foundation. So if you'd like to write your question down, you're going to pass those forward. We're going to do all the questions we can. Um, I did not know that I was not supposed to park on my septic drain field. So I learned something. So next person I want to introduce is uh, Steve Swab. And uh, Steve has uh, been a civil engineer for 25 years. Uh, I first met Steve uh, when we both worked for Sarasota County Government, and Steve was mapping out all the watersheds in the county. I mean, like down to some super precision. I would tell you that I think that this guy probably knows more about the watersheds in Sarasota County than anybody else that's alive. Um, next thing you know, he was the director of stormwater for Sarasota County. Uh, and then the next time I meet him, he's helping out folks down in Lemon Bay and the Inglewood area, spending time down there. The next time I run into him, he's involved in a water quality improvement project in the South Venice neighborhood, which is pretty cool. Uh, now he's the water set manager for Progressive Water Solutions. He's all over the place trying to address these issues that we're talking about tonight. Again, he's speaking again tomorrow night. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we find our way through some of these issues down the road, remember me saying tonight that Steve's going to be a part of that because we need what he has in his head to help us through this. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Steve Swab. Good evening. It's, uh, it's great to be with you all. I couldn't agree with John Moore. We have a problem. And... There are people, we know at least one here tonight that remembers the way things used to be. It was within the lifetime of people that lived here. That it was dramatically different. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Can you turn up the reverb? <laughs> okay, so um, I want to also thank Abby for giving a really good overview on the science. Um, as John mentioned I've been practicing in this area for over 35 years, and so I hope to shed some more specific information on what's happening with nutrients and touch on septic tanks even. Um, and, and let you know what you can do as well. Okay, so the first thing is when we talk about all these algae of all different colors, they're being fed by nutrients, primarily phosphorus and nitrogen. And different nutrients kind of favor different algae and whatnot. But the state of Florida has, has developed fairly recently allowable concentrations for nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are the two nutrients of concern. But they all tie back to having healthy biology in the creeks, in our waterways, in our lakes, in the bay. Nutrients, this is important, I think, point is our surrogate for determining if the biology is healthy. But it's all about having healthy biology. So one of the projects that I got involved in in my community, I live in South Venice and have served uh, on the South Venice Civic Association Board. We've had meetings like this over the years. And we decided as a community to try to improve our water quality. This was even before the red tide, probably about 10 years ago this goes back, in some of our ditches. South Venice. Very similar, I would think, to Northport. It's old platted lots with open drainage, swales, public streets, um, you know, no storm, storm uh, inlets and in, uh, or north and curb and gutter and that kind of thing. And what we looked at doing, um, there was a gentleman that lived in our community when he was a little kid. He came back after serving in the military, and he noticed things had changed. Things were much drier. Things seemed more like a desert. So he started to try to restore in his view, restore the, the waterways that he remembers. It started with just the swales along the road. 
And what he did, you can see in the upper left, the, and this is pretty typical, things are, get dry, it's sandy, it's erosive. He brought in mulch that was at the local park from the county, and so he just brought it in, it was there for free, and he spread that out, and then he brought in um, a topsoil and spread that out on top, and lo and behold, the grass just started to grow into, into a natural stabilized system. And then he did that on the ditch, on the deeper ditches. Basically the same thing, erosive ditches, um, the, the waterway is very stagnant, no oxygen, virtually devoid of life. You have these waterways that have no evidence of birds or, or, or turtles or, or, or amphibians of any kind in them. He hauled in mulch, put it along the banks, then he got down in the ditch with hip waders, if you can imagine this, and a rake. And he started scooping up the muck in the bottom and piling it up on the bank and tearing it with the wood chips and it formed a very stable soil. Uh, and what we found was that when you start digging up that muck, there's a sandy bottom that goes back probably several decades before certain maintenance practices that we found out have been going on for a long time, dumped vegetation in the bottom and decomposed. So the water started flowing and within days there was life. There were, you know, crabs coming up from Alligator Creek and birds back and frogs. Um, and so the community really started to pay attention to this. He, no sooner did he get done with his restoration that the county came out with their mower. And they just scraped all the vegetation and mowed it, which, which I guess is okay, but the practice that, that is so insidious that's been happening for decades is they just let all that vegetation drop to the bottom of the ditch and decompose. And that turns into this, over time, organic muck and takes out the cleats oxygen. You know, we, we end up with these green uh, soup canals. So the community rallied around uh, this, this gentleman who was like the pipe piper. And we'd go out every Saturday morning with our rakes and our hip waders and we'd clean it all back up again. And it became, uh, over time, a, a great community um, activity where a lot of people got involved in it in the neighborhood beautification program what's and whatnot. But it also um, it also opened my eyes to not just the maintenance practices, but building healthy soil back and the benefits of that in terms of water quality. And so there's a broader discussion, right? So we have again the two nutrients that are uh, of issue primarily are phosphorus and nitrogen. One of the things unique to Sarasota, and when you're addressing these things, it's good to focus on what is important in this area. Um, the hydrogeology of Florida is so diverse. We have springs, we have rivers, we have the Everglades, um, we have lakes. Uh, it's so diverse. In our part of the state, we're located in a very unique geological formation that is extremely rich naturally in phosphorus. That's why mosaic is mining it. County. That there's such rich deposits at the surface up there that it's you know they're not they're not mining it where it's not. But that phosphorus, when you find shark's teeth along uh, Venice Beach, those are rich in phosphorus. Bones are, are rich in phosphorus. So as a result, um, our soils and our water have higher nitrogen concentrations than pretty much anywhere else in the state. But over the eons, the environment has adapted to that. Um, and um, so that, that's, that's, a, that's, again, very unique to this part of Florida. And one of the revelations on that is you don't really need phosphorus in fertilizer. It's already in the soil. The golf course industry in southwest Florida knows this. They don't use phosphorus uh, on golf courses in southwest Florida because it's in the Bone Valley and it's already rich in phosphorus. So phosphorus is off the table. We don't, we don't need it, and our systems have adapted to it. On the other hand, nitrogen is our issue, okay? And I want to spend a little bit on time on this. Um, Abby talked about a word that I really want maybe you to, to go home with. It's called denitrification. It's a big word, but it's extremely important to how we may end up addressing our nutrient problem. Nitrogen is like water. It can exist in gas, liquid, and solid phase. And there is also a natural cycle of nitrogen, just like the hydrologic cycle where water can evaporate and rain and, and move through the, earth, the, the soils and, and plants. 
Nitrogen can do the same thing, believe it or not. Abby mentioned 78% of the atmosphere is naturally nitrogen, but it's very stable. However, there are natural bacteria that can extract the nitrogen and fix it into the soil for plants to use and convert it to ammonia nitrogen. And there are other bacteria, natural bacteria in the soil, that can convert that ammonia nitrogen to nitrite and nitrate for plants to use. Nitrate and nitrate are very reactive. That, that, if, if that's present, it, it goes right to uh, feeding plants and algae and whatnot. And there's a third type of natural bacteria in soil uh, and water times that, that can then convert that nitrate back to nitrogen gas and complete the cycle. Okay? So when things are in balance, this all works really nicely. It depends on healthy soil. Because without healthy soil, you can't have the bacteria and the microbes uh, and the mycorrhizae and all the stuff that moves water and nutrients through it, through the environment. What happened was, <clears throat> Around World War II, the German chemists figured out how to chemically extract nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Like I said, it's very stable in the atmosphere, but we finally figured out a way to extract it. And it was extracted um, uh, primarily for agriculture, to be able to have fertilizer to grow things. Just put fertilizer on stuff and it'll grow. You don't have to worry about having healthy soil anymore. And as a result, by 1950, we figured this out, and that's really when the, what they call the Green Revolution started, being able to grow food to, to support the populations that were growing all over the world. It all had to do, really, with this haber boff method of being able to mine or nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Um, and primarily in the form of ammonia or nitrate. So it's very reactive. It goes right to the plants. And as a result, um, Agriculture in this country in particular was able to not worry about how healthy their soils were anymore. They could just add water and these fertilizers and things would grow. And, and the more they add, the better they grew. That was the philosophy. That's what's kind of come home to roost because now all of that nitrogen is in the soils and the water that's built up over time and we have all these algae problems. Okay, and we looked at, um, this is two watersheds. I, 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 the bottom line in this is, what, we've, what we have found is, as watersheds go from being natural and undeveloped to more developed, where, where man is adding nutrients, um, specifically these, these reactive nutrients from fertilizer and wastewater byproducts, we're seeing the percent of the total nitrogen that is this inorganic nitrate is increasing percentage of total nitrogen is increasing as you urbanize in the watershed and man has their influence. So it's really, not only, it's not just that nitrogen is our issue, specifically it's nitrate is our issue. And if you remember the nitrogen cycle, the key to address it is denitrification. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so I mentioned the sources of this nitrate. What are the sources of this nitrate that we're putting in the watershed uh, for man activities? It's primarily excess fertilizer use. We don't have a lot of agriculture in uh, Sarasota County, um, but you know, in areas where they do, that can be a big issue, but we do, we have fertilizer ordinance, so if everybody's abiding by that, the, this may not be as, as, a, as big an issue here. Um, wastewater that is not treated for nutrients. Um, we, call, we call it basically, uh, if it's treated for nutrients, it's called advanced wastewater treatment or AWT. So wastewater that is not AWT can be extremely high in nutrients. And whether you discharge that, whether it's a spill or an overflow, or you're putting that out on the landscape, the landscape may not be able to take up all that nitrogen. And the remainder remains in the plants and the soil and gets into the water. Uh, municipal biosolids, that's the treated sludge from wastewater. In our, in Sarasota County, all of, it's coincidentally, Sarasota County and all three cities haul their biosolids to a composting operation in Charlotte County. Where it's composted and, and converted into Class AA uh, compost. Um, and finally, we've mentioned the on-site uh, wastewater treatment and disposal systems or septic tanks. Nitrate is the effluent that, that's coming out of those as well. And it's a soluble form it can move in water. And what about stormwater? 
Storm water is the conduit. It carries these nutrients from these sources. And what we've done is indicated over time, some of the old aerials, is we've gone from having a landscape that held a lot of water on it. You saw all the wetlands in 1948. And we basically drained them all. We connected them with ditches like connect the dots puzzle, and we just moved all that water out so we could have farming, we could have uh, mosquito control, we could have development. Um, good intention, but it probably was overkill. It, pro it's, 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 it was needed for those things, but it's probably overdraining the land. And so any nutrients that are on the landscape now can get out to the bay more efficiently. What we've seen in recent years, probably the past decade, as, as was noted, that because of this, the amount of uh, waterways and, and watersheds that are impaired for nutrients are increasing. That list is growing every year. Our stormwater ponds are not as efficient as, as has been presumed. There was movement about a decade ago to update the stormwater rules for new development caps all. Um, that didn't go through. So lastly, I just want to talk about some of the solutions. We've been using, um, even before the red tide, some passive media to help with this, these natural processes of denitrification. Two of them are as simple as wood chips and sawdust. Sawdust is a waste product with unlimited supply in Florida. And mixing it with sand, we've used it in trenches, that, that the wood chips and the sawdust are a carbon source that if you get it in an anaerobic environment, it is a food source for the bacteria that causes nitrate to denitrify. So if nitrate has, water rich nitrate has to flow through this media, and that media is underwater, it's got to be anaerobic, the bacteria will form and cause that to denitrify. Another media that we've been using is something called biochar, and it is organic media that has been heated without oxygen, essentially. Um, they found it first in South America in rich deposits around ancient uh, civilizations, and they realized that it is a wonderful soil amendment. Things will grow like crazy. Um, I've noticed since then that a natural forest fire, basically when you get a forest fire and the flames get high, there's very little oxygen at the base, it will char the palmettos and the pine. You go out and scrape them and, and basically it's, it's, it's charcoal. So that's nature's way of putting carbon back into the soil. To have healthy soils, the number one indicator for that is the percentage of the soils that is organic carbon. Okay, organic farmers know this, regenerative farmers know this. That's what it's all about in terms of building and managing soils and going back to that. And once you do that, you're, you become less reliable, less reliant on, on droughts and fertilizers. This is a this is a nursery up in North Florida, uh, just you know, in, in the state. Very high nitrate concentrations from fertilizer. There's streams that run through the middle of it. What what was done was a, a 1,200 a foot trench was dug parallel to the waterway along the perimeter and it was filled with sawdust and sand and covered back up so you don't even know it's there and it intercepted the nitrate plume that was seeping out uh, through the superficial water table and dropped the nitrate level 60 percent. The University of Florida got involved and they found conservatively that this would last for 15 years. I've seen other studies and, and that say 20 to 50 years. Um, and the other real revelation from the University of Florida was that the cost, um, this is so effective, this is so cost effective, it's such a cheap way to do it, that the cost was 36 pounds of, I think it says, per pound of nitrogen removed. That's insane. The Water Management District will consider $200 per pound of nitrogen a good project if you can do that. So, these, these kind of technologies have been proven when we talk about septic tanks. Um, Abby touched on this by adding a denitrification. The health department in Florida has figured this out as well. They've been looking at this for over a decade, and they figured out if we add denitrification systems to septic fields, that it can, what happens in a septic tank is it converts the ammonia to nitrate through the drain field. And that's why you have the two foot from the water field. So the reduction that Abby was showing that's basically a conversion of ammonia to nitrate, nitrogen ammonia to nitrate. The issue is it, that process is not complete until you get rid of the nitrate for denitrification. Here's the good news, and this is from my experience locally in, in Sarasota. Unless you're right on the waterway and it's a steep slope, there, I, I, I'm, 
and I've talked to many people about this, and I've looked at a lot of data, we believe there is a lot of denitrification happening naturally. Why? Because our hydrogeology, is, our topography is so flat that it takes a long time for water to move uh, once it even enters the water table. And if that condition is anaerobic, you're in the water table, and there's any carbon source for that bacteria to form, and there's, a, there's just a lot of opportunity for denitrification to occur. The data that I've looked at in Sarasota County, where there's a lot of septic tanks, is showing that's probably what's happening. Okay? But we could, be, we could be putting in these barriers as an insurance, and we could be putting in new septic tanks when they're needed to be replaced, or if they have to put one in that have these denitrification systems. And Abby was right, it's the Florida Springs and Aquifer Protection Act that was passed by the Florida legislature in 2016 that requires this around springs. And finally, um, we've been using this uh, for several years up in Lakewood Ranch to clean wastewater that we get from Manatee County that is not AWT. It's wastewater that's not really treated for nutrients, uh, similar to Sarasota County's. And we've been able to create a, a, a system using wood chips and the biochar. Wood chips for denitrification gets rid of the nitrogen, and the biochar um, that we've designed actually with the University of Florida absorbs the phosphorus. And it's extremely effective. We're getting like 90 to 100% removal of phosphorus in 15 minutes of contact time. So the water only has to be in, in contact with the biochar for 15 minutes to get those kind of removals. Once it's full of the um, phosphorus, we figure it's about a year life, we can recycle that as a soil then because the biochar holds on to it until the plants need it so you can put it in, in soil. And we've talked to like bigger supply. They're very interested in, in marketing the, the waste product. It's really uh, as valuable. So um, we've, we've been running these tests for a year. We're getting ready to build the system, but we've been, had no problem meeting the, the AWT standards for nutrient reduction. So um, with that, um, I just have a summary of, of some things. And I've got a handout that I need for hands along the water that I'll pass along to Bill um, and some things to do. I would say, number one, first and foremost, is build soil. That is what require if you if you do that you don't have to use as much fertilizer if at all you don't have, you shouldn't have to use as much water as well which causes it to run off um, I also uh, my wife and I bought a lot up in the in Gillespie Park they have a composting operation a contract with Sunshine Sunshine Com Community Compost uh, your communities could engage them to start one in your community I have super bags of biochar out at Lakewood Ranch that we're not going to use. I'll dedicate it to it if you want. It's, you can add it to the compost to create the carbon content. Because biochar is actually, when you put it in the soil, not only are you enhancing the soil, but you're sequestering carbon for thousands of years. This stuff is still in, in the Amazon and in South America, and they think it's been there for thousands of years. It's got a carbon. It, it's a way to keep the organics and decompose it. So there's a, there's a list of things, but first and foremost, I've, all, I've become a very big advocate for building soil. So thank you very much. All right. I mean, just great. We just solve all this problem with sawdust and charcoal, man. We've got to get going here. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Simple equation. A little chemistry, a little science. Okay. Our, uh, our, our final speaker that we're going to add to the panel here, and when, once we're wrapped up this, we're going to all come up to the front and we'll be taking your questions. So if you have questions, put them on your cards. Uh, John Thaxton, local guy, uh, knows the land and water of this county like the back of his hand and really this whole part of Florida, uh, and a champion for the environmental lands program, former uh, county commissioner, now senior uh, vice president of Gulf Coast Community Foundation. Who gave us all the nice orange pens? And uh, the friend of Nokomis, and a friend to Nokomis, John Thaxton. Thank you, John. Okay. We're going to have to adjust this up a bit. In the back, we are right? Pat? Yeah, man? Patrick, you're not raising your hand. You can hear me? He still doesn't hear me. <laughs> I'm assuming it's okay. So first thing I want to do... Is Bill come up here, man? I want to compliment Bill on his choice of clothing. <laughs> <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's the very same slides yeah. and, and shirts. Yep. Yeah. Well done. Um, I'm also glad that I'm not backing or coming right after John McCarthy because I can never match his uh, speaking skills nor his speaking speed. Mm -hmm. I clocked him one time. 
and he does 120 words a minute. Wow. He does. And the average speaker, in, uh, that you listen to television, does about 60 to 70 words a minute. So he does three to four times that. So are we going to get the lights for my slide presentation here? Yeah. Oh, wait. I forgot. I don't have slides. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of did it old school. I was asked to do a similar presentation to the one that I opened the Sarasota County Water Summit for, and that's what I'm going to do. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is John Thaxton. I am a reformed uh, politician. I'm doing my best to stay away from that sort of thing. I'm a fifth generation Sarasotan. I grew up in the town of Osprey on a chicken farm that is now known as Rossler's Restaurant. So if you go to Rossler's Restaurant, you're dining in my living room. If you're drinking a cocktail, you're having a cocktail in my family room. Um, so that's kind of my background. I grew up on the commercial fishing boats here in the Osprey Laurel and Macomas area. And I'm a longtime friend and acquaintance of Terry Sanders from Laurel. <laughs> Sandy Terry. Mayor of Laurel now. <laughs> it's kind of an insight mayor. between her. So anyways, to kind of help me stay, obviously I need a little bit of help staying on time and on topic. I selected three quotes that I'm going to, uh, to reference in, in, in my presentation. And I'm going to kind of structure my comments around these three quotes. So I'm going to start with the very first one. And that is from the quote master himself, Will Rogers. And Will Rogers said, you never get a second chance to make a good first impression. And so what I thought about first impressions for Sarasota County, um, everything is internet now, right? So most first impressions of people coming into an area are what they get from the internet. So when I went on Google, I did a Google search for all of the major enterprises in Sarasota County, including the Sarasota County governments and municipal governments, the Economic Development Corporations, the Chamber of Commerce, the major industries in the employment sectors, hospitals, school boards, and everything like that. And I <coughs> copied their landing page, right? That's it. Water, 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 and water. Everywhere you look, there's nothing but water. And so I started thinking to myself, you know, why is it that, you know, that all these, 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 these handsomely paid marketeers from all around the country are coming into our community, and despite the fact that we have this wonderful education system, amazing libraries, wonderful housing, low taxes, and all these things, they've chosen water to be the very first impression that people coming to this area see. And so I think the reason is really pretty intuitive, it's pretty simple, um, and that is from a marketing and from an economics perspective. Water is critical and important to our reason. Forget the tree huggers and the conservation and the environment and all that kind of thing. Just from brass tacks, from economics and, and, and social planning, uh, water is, is critical. So at a recent water, at the recent water summit, um, I was asked to kind of cover the ground that numerous speakers were going to present on at the Water Summit. And as I reviewed the material, including the material that, uh, that the speakers talked about tonight, I would suggest to you that we are not entering into any new or uncharted waters with the information that we're hearing. So let me give you kind of some um, ideas about what I'm talking about to reinforce that, um, that claim. In September of 1986, the Moat Marine Laboratory convened a group of local elected officials, and they pledged to hold a water summit for Sarasota Bay water quality. In seven what months, year, John? That was 1986. Mm. And then about seven months later, New College hosted something called the Sarah Basis Symposium. And they had 20 qualified speakers come to the symposium and speak on issues of water quality. And what they discussed was wastewater, stormwater runoff, and seagrass enhancement. And that resulted in two really um, important papers. The first one was in 1987, and that is an outline of Sarasota Bay management issues and opportunities. The second one, in 1988, was the identification of resource management problems and issues 
in the Sarasota Bay watershed. So these are all county baywide watershed issues. Um, just a side note, if you've not seen this 1988 report of all the things that I won't speak of and Steve or everybody, this is the one you need to read because this one is remarkably revealing. It was actually sent by to the uh, Department of Envi Federal Department of Environmental Protection and the Florida um, Department, excuse me, the, the Federal EPA and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So what did these reports cover? Well, they covered urbanization, pollution, development-based pollution, is what they call it, sea level rise, stormwater, and wastewater. So that inspired the creation of a new program called the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Program, one of three national estuary programs that are contiguous on the southwest coast of Florida, including the Tampa Bay and the Charlotte Harbor. So in 1993, the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Program, they published their first science-based comprehensive conservation management plan called the Framework for Action. This report. This report called for a significant decrease in nitrogen, improvements in wastewater treatment, removal of septic tanks, and better treatment of stormwater. You're noticing a trend here. What year, John? That was in 1993. And then in 2012, New College and the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Program sponsored a Sarasota Bay Water Symposium. And what they focused on was better stormwater management, reduced nutrients, including nitrogen, and the creation of Florida friendly guards. And finally, in 2014, New, uh, in 2014, the Sarasota Bay National Estuary Program published their most recent science based comprehensive conservation management plan, um, an update called the State of the Bay Report. This one, that's in 2014. What did they identify as the outstanding needs of action for this community? Stormwater. Wastewater. Wastewater. Exactly. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, quote number two, Yogi Berra. Do we get the feeling like we need to avoid its deja vu all over again? <laughs> now, but before I say what I'm not ready to say, which gets a lot of people kind of peeved off, which is okay. Um, I, I, you know, it, it's, 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 it's stingly obvious. Um, I do understand the need for continued research. I've spent much of my life doing research, and research is important. We're still doing research on major medical issues, such as cancer. But that doesn't mean that we've not taken the existing resources and research and acted upon it. Right? We're acting upon the research that we have, the data and the information that we know. And I also think it's important that we continue to have these community forums and these symposiums and things and talk about the issues and also celebrate the successes that we have had from previous efforts. But today, we have the data, we have the facts, we have the science needed to take action, and the time to act is now. In Sarasota County, we have wastewater treatment systems, both on-site and off-site wastewater treatment um, plants that are grossly underperforming. We have stormwater systems that were never designed for nutrient uptake that need a redesign so that we do take these nutrients out. And as a community, we need to become more aware of our day-to-day -day activities that impact water quality, and darn it, we really need to do something about it. So at the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, we are um, doing what we can. We have assembled a team of professionals to help evaluate and prioritize and act upon many of the ideas that you've heard, on, uh, heard about today and those that are um, in the public forum. Um, and what we're designing is something that we hope to look like a community playbook, where you can look at this and better manage the nutrients in your yard, in your community, and at the state. And finally, quote number three. General George S. Patton. A good plan well executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. Let's commit as a community to making a good plan that we can execute now and ensure these stunning first impressions for generations to come.
on up, folks. All right. So, 33 years ago, 1986, New College, Sarah Basis. I was the first presenter of the morning. 33 years ago, we knew we needed to address this issue. 33 years later, we're sitting here with an issue that's uh, kind of out of control at this point. But what I learned is that um, we can mix sawdust and charcoal together and solve most of these problems. Uh, I want to point out just, just briefly before we get into the questions that uh, the project that Steve was talking about up there in Lakewood Ranch, that is an initiative of the Lakewood Ranch developers themselves uh, with some funding from a uh, state uh, water management district agency. But it's a private developer kind of taking the lead to see what they can do on their own. And luckily, they got the right water consultant involved. So uh, if you have questions, put them on a 3 by 5 card. And uh, we're going to do the best we can sharing the microphone. So I'm going to pass this down here because nobody needs that to hear me. And uh, we're going to start with a couple questions. But I can sure use some more questions. So here they are. All right, let's see what we got here. Septic tank modification cost, 10 to 20,000. What is the approximate cost if done initially? In other words, what if you were building a new house and you installed a septic system? How much more would it cost to do this thing right? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to, but I could get back to you. Um, I just know the 10 to $20,000 mark for retrofits. Um, I don't know how much the system, that two-stage process for passive um, nitrification, denitrification is on its own, but it seems like you still have to dig up the land. I don't, I don't know. It's probably around the same. Do you have an idea? Five to ten. Oh. Five to ten more to start from scratch. Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's expensive stuff. This septic stuff's expensive stuff. If anybody's had to replace a tank and a drain field and all that stuff, you're going to spend a lot of money on that, too. Here's another question. Does all household gray water flow into the septic tank? Uh, does all of it need to in order for proper operation? In other words, are we putting a bunch of stuff in there maybe we don't need to put in there? Yeah, all of your house water flows into your septic tank. So your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, and your toilets and your laundry, it all goes into the same tank. Whether or not it needs to, um, I'm not sure. Maybe Steve would make things answer that question. But as you could probably guess, when looking at how much nitrogen each one contributes, your kitchen sink, your toilet, your bathroom sink, which one do you think contributes the most nitrogen? It's your toilet, right? So I don't think you really have to worry about those other things. It's your toilet by um, huge amounts. Uh, your kitchen sink is 0 0.6 grams per person per day, while your toilet is 8.7 grams per person per day. So we really just need to think about after the flush. So we heard a lot about septic tanks, and that was one of our intents, knowing that a lot of folks in the comments were on it. But what about all the raw sewage being spilled into the water? Over and over, it seems like. What about that? Well, since I work for Sierra City County Government, I guess I'll take that one. Um, so there's two issues, right? So there's raw sewage, but then there's also reclaimed water, what it's called reclaimed water. So it's treated water, and that's also going into um, surface waters, which is not allowed because of um, a piece of legislation called the, no, it's called, no, the Clean Water Act does actually allow surface waters of um, tertiary treated wastewater, but because we live in Sarasota, which is next to Tampa, there's some act that brings, Grizzle Fig, Grizzle Fig, thank you, I knew there was an act, that doesn't allow you to put tertiary treated, it has to be advanced treated water into surface water bodies. So, um, Yes, that is a problem. Yes, Sarasota County uh, staff is really ripe to tackle that problem. Yes, we need funds because it's a very expensive problem um, due to the many ways in which overflows can occur. And you want me to go into more detail again? Does that satisfy? We got more questions. But we, 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 we got we to do these though. So let, let me go ahead, let me keep on moving. Um, what, and, and if I get this question wrong for the purpose of the proposal, what percentage of capacity is Sarasota County at as the wastewater right now? Now, we don't have anybody here from the utilities department. I, I can answer that preliminary, and then maybe somebody else would like to chime in. But I know that um, the Bee Ridge plan is actually um, 
not utilized to full capacity. There's, I think, at least two um, million gallons per day that they could increase because they have a permit for that. Um, so I know that at least for the Bee Ridge plant, it's under capacity. Well, I, I think utility staff would acknowledge that they have enough to treatment capacity to take the water in and treat it, but they have challenges at the other end with the disposal of the water. That they don't have enough end users to use up all the water. That's why at times it is being discharged in the the tree. So when you talk about plant capacity, Sarasota County has three plants, so you have to look at each one of those, and there's three municipalities, uh, six, uh, Sarasota, Venice, and Northport, so it depends on which plant you're talking about. But capacity, I think we need to start thinking about in terms of not just its treatment capacity, if the water takes in, but then once it's, it's treated, if it's still high in nutrients, and not all wastewater is created equal. Uh, City of Sarasota is probably the poster child for treating wastewater. They are beyond AWT. They're about to at 50 percent have about half of that. Um, but at the other end is the Bee Ridge plant that, as Abby mentioned, is around 18 milligrams per liter. That's really high nitrogen. So when that goes out into the waterways and it's large volumes, it's, it ends up being a lot of tons of nitrogen. So we need to be looking at both intake and addressing the outer, the, the, uh, the disposal of this water when we talk about the past. Steve, while well, you got the bike here, what can homeowners and or the association do to build the soil the way you were talking about uh, and improve this denitrification. Uh, yeah, so um, in my community, um, we're looking at installing some of these trenches along our waterways and filling them with wood chips and sand for denitrification. Um, but at, at the home scale, like I said, um, I'm excited to move into Gillespie Park. I think there's other communities in the county that actually have an active composting operation. And they actually, you can take your your yard waste or even food waste, and you'll have your own. You have your own bin. They'd like to know when to, you know they help turn it over, but then when it's done, you have soil that you can then bring back that you can use to help build your soil. And you know it has the microbes in it. It has, or you can just talk to John Thaxton and go visit his house because he's he can tell you what he's done, and, and it's, he's probably the best example for what we're talking about. I'm going to go back to the wastewater. Um, but anyways, what I did at my house is I just returned it to a natural photo landscape. Um, it's taken me about 10 years, but there's virtually no place in my yard where you cannot put a shovel in the ground and not find earthworms. They're virtually everywhere. It's a living soil for about 8 to 12 inches deep before you ever get to dirt or sand that actually has all these microbes in it that, you know, has the uh, nitrogen um, denitrification process and the carbon-rich soil, such as it is. You fertilize? I do not fertilize. Sure. No. I don't fertilize. God fertilizes for me. I don't have to worry about it, right? And also, I have no stormwater runoff that leaves my property because by the time the rainwater um, passes through the leaves and then goes through the mid-story and then through three layers of understory and then gets through this eight-inch layer of organic soil, there's no water to run off. It's, it's all absorbed. Um, on site. But just a moment, I want to go back because the, the numbers that they're talking about are significant here. And these are these milligrams per, per liter. The city of Sarasota's milligrams per liter at the end of their treatment process is three. And no, it's one and a half. One and a half. I'm trying to be conservative here. All right. One and a half to, to three. It's, it's, it's very, very low. B Ridge is 18. There's so much nitrogen in the discharge of the B Ridge plant that they do not even have a marketable reuse water product. Nobody will buy it because nobody wants to assume the responsibility for denitrifying the nitrogen-rich water that they have. So not only will you improve the environment in Philippi Creek and the other Roberts Bay up, up to the north, but you will also then have a product that makes your utility system more fiscally viable because you can now sell the product. Um, two things. One, so yes, it has 18 milligrams 
per liter, and that's a lot of nitrogen, but yet people still fertilize on top of that, and that's something that we at Extension is, we're trying to combat. We're trying to help them calculate how much nitrogen should they use given that their reclaimed water has, is so high in nitrogen itself. Secondly, it's just hard to get rid of reclaimed water in the wet season, because who needs water in the wet season? No one. And so that is our problem. Um, just like drinking water, our problem is storing water in the dry season, or in the wet season to use in the dry season. Um, for reclaimed water, it's just getting rid of it in the wet season, because no one needs, no one needs it. Okay, um, thank you. So there's a question here, it says, the conversion of septic tank stated costs about $150 million. who pays for it? I think that the 150 million is a price of getting like plants like that Bee Ridge up to advanced wastewater treatment. No, what's the 150 for? So I wish that my colleague who came up with that number was here, but I could just say that um, Britain was um, take, taking those 10,000 septic tanks and converting them to central sewer. Those were within 900 feet of a surface water body, plus expanding the South Venice. Um, wastewater treatment facility so that it could take all of that 10,000 uh, septic tank. Um, but I don't believe it extended beyond that. Okay, so that doesn't take care of the advanced wastewater treatment the way the city's doing it. Yeah, that's a different price tag. But what I want you to understand is that 150 million is just a number. And really what you should think about is just, it's, a, it's going to be a lot of money. So we need to think about where does that money come from and are we willing to pay for it? So um, the state of Florida has this, um, and I have a little bit of experience with this because I funded a lot of these projects during my tenure as a county commissioner. And then 20 years before that, I watched previous uh, para county commissioners also um, with their funding formulas are the septic tank replacements and um, improvements to the central wastewater treatment facilities. And the state of Florida has something called the Pollution Recovery Trust Fund. And the Pollution Recovery Trust Fund is funded from fines, substantial fines, that are paid by businesses and industries and uh, private individuals and even governments put, in, put money into this, um, this fund. And then the money is redistributed in the regional area where the fund is collected for improvements to things such as septic, to sewer conversions, um, improvements to wastewater facilities, and other things in the natural environment that can improve uh, wastewater systems um, in the region. Unfortunately, though, there's like no money in the fund anymore. So where for decades past, local governments, such as Sarasota County, have been able to uh, solicit funds from the Pollution Recovery Trust Fund for things like AWT advancement, for septic to sewer programs. They can't anymore because there's no money in it because for the last nine years, the state of Florida has taken this position that we're just simply not going to find polluters for violations. And that's exactly what we did. And so during that period of time, that last eight or nine years, that fund has now been depleted. And so unless we have a reversal of that administrative policy that says that we will hold these violators of you know all of these pollution laws that we have accountable and build that trust fund up, it's going to be difficult for Sarasota County to get federal, regional, or state funds because there's just not a lot of dedicated funding sources to offset the cost for homeowners to improve their wastewater disposal um, systems. So when we need the money the most, it's not available to us. That's not a good situation to be in. I got a couple of easy questions here, and then we'll get to some tougher ones. Do um, our food disposals add to the nutrient problems in a septic system, and what are the options? Should we be putting our food scraps into solid waste instead of the down the drain? So if you want to be septic smart, you would not put food down your garbage disposal, actually. Um, that's great for compost. And we have lots of compost classes at Extension. It's called Black Gold. You can look it up. We um, not only give you a geo bin to help you start your own compost, but we tell you all the do's and don'ts and how to do it. And so it's um, very easy, something that you can do, and it's a great place to put those food scraps. Not a great place to put those food scraps is down your your disposal, unfortunately. That is true. 
then I got a question as to why do we continue to allow the wet wipes people to put a label on their product that says that they're flexible when everybody knows they're not, even the plumbers that have to clean them out of the pipes. That's a great we got to stop buying those I wet wipes. I don't know how that's allowed, but it All certainly right. continues. Here's another easy question. This one I love because I'm a wood carving, a woodworking guy. How about I just cover my drain field with wood chips and sawdust? Cover it? Yeah, just cover it, man. No, it has to be anaerobic. It has to be under under uh, no oxygen, not like underwater. So that's why it's good to get it down below the down below the um, the drain field. So it's hard to do it with an existing drain. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. But, that's but, why a barrier along the waterway may be more cost effective. Yeah. So if you have a, a drain field close to the water, you cut a trench yeah. and you put some of that stuff in there, and you caught it before it gets into the water. That would be a the county is actually looking at um, some projects next year of looking at putting wood chips along the water. To, to look at nitrite and the tree. Where do you buy biochar? <laughs> uh, you can find it on, on the internet. Some, uh, I think Big Earth Supply is selling it as a soil amendment. Um, I have a little um, uh, pyrolyzer, it's called the, the Florida House that I've used, but you can, there's people that are buying it um, or selling it uh, primarily on the internet. Um, I'm hoping I've got I've, my you know one of the biggest concerns I've had with the production of biochar and its efficiency now is uh, especially in the Everglades like phosphorus is not an issue here but you go over across the ridge and uh, the watershed over there and I, that's the issue is phosphorus so how could you take it to scale and I've actually been talking to uh, five producers that are talking about building facilities in Florida within the next year. And what we're looking at doing is licensing out this production of phosphorus removal so that we can have a lot of it here. Because to take it to scale um, is, the, is the next challenge. But there's a lot of interest in this. I would say when I started looking at this five years ago, there were maybe a dozen universities that were researching it. Now you can't count how many there are. You know, it's just taken off. University of Florida is all over it for, as well for soil amendment and, and, uh, and nutrient removal. All right, well, given all that the nitrogen that's heading downstream in Cowpen Slough down into Donna Bay, you know, we're talking about the septic tanks, but uh, kind of what's, is it really septic tanks or is it all that nitrogen coming down Cowpen Slough into Donna Bay that's impacting us right here in the coast? Yeah, I, I don't, you know, the issue with Cowpen Slough, quite frankly, and I initiated that project, is, is there's too much fresh water. Uh, the, that whole that whole Calpin Slough used to drain to the Miapa River uh, until it was diverted to to Blue Mountain Bay, and it just overwhelmed the estuary and wiped out the oyster population. So the whole program was really about trying to reduce the flow by keeping it on the land longer, maybe using some for water supply, so that we could uh, increase the salinity levels in the bay to the point where the oyster population could again be stabilized and exist. Um, it wasn't really a water quality uh, project. There would be benefits to water quality if you reduce the amount of water because um, it's, we talk about the concentration of nutrients, but it's that times the volume that really causes the pounds to load. So the volume of water, the total volume is an important thing, but that's really what the Down Bay uh, and Falcon Slough project was about too much fresh water. So another question, and I don't know that we have the technical authority to answer it, but we'll answer it anyway. Uh, are the beach signs at Nokomis Beach accurate for that day water quality wise? Uh, my understanding is that they do not test the water quality at the beach every day. The health department does come out and periodically test the water quality as part of their beach program. Does anybody want to say anything more about this? I thought it was a, at a frequency, a daily frequency, but it, the sign is from the water quality from the day before because they take them in the morning, then it takes time to run them, and then they get the results in the afternoon, and then they post the sign, and then you don't see it to the next day, so it's from the day before. And then by the time they test it again, a lot of times they, they lift the, the, the swimming. Yeah, it can be lifted within 24 hours, but you could go to a website, and you can actually get alerts onto your phone about beach conditions. Um, so the Department of Health has um, a website that lists all the beaches, and actually better yet, the um, Sarasota County Water Atlas has all the links on one page that makes it really easy for you to see the beach conditions report uh, for Sarasota County beaches. And um, if you need help finding that, you
you could just Google Sarasota County Water Atlas Beach Condition and you should go right to that page. All right, this person did a little research maybe before they got here, maybe after they got here on their phone. US EPA shows 75% uh, of the country on sewers, 25% on septics, and that they see septics as an acceptable in place of a sewage system. So, um, what I know is that uh, the state of Florida has about 2 million plus uh, septic tanks in use, and 40% of those are in the coastal zone where there's lots of sandy soils and high water tables. Um, is it a coincidence that we also have high nitrogen going to our base? I'm not quite sure, um, but I would say that if we're moving to advanced wastewater treatment, which you cannot have more than 3 milligrams per liter of nitrogen versus a 60 milligrams per liter of nitrogen in your septic tank, it seems like moving to central sewer that has advanced treatment would be the best way to remove nitrogen from our water. Okay. So I think the first rule of thumb with septic tanks is the acknowledgement that all septic tanks are not created equal. I mean, you know, we can, just like wastewater, right? I mean, we could have a rule here in Florida that we need to build to earthquake standards too, right? And you know, we could, you know, that could be something we do, or hurricane standards in California is just not applicable for the area. So we have 40,000 septic systems in Sarasota County. Um, we know that they are a contributor to nitrogen, but they're not all contributing equal. What really needs to happen is a very business-like solution, an opportunity cost analysis, where we target those septic tanks that are older in the water table, near surface waters, and only focus on those for conversion to wastewater. Because there's much better efficient, dollar efficiency in moving from tertiary treatment to AWT in a large scale plant than there is trying to focus on the 30,000 plus septic tanks that are only contributing 20 plus percent of the nitrogen. Let's focus on those 10, 15, 20 percent of the tanks that are contributing the vast majority of the nitrogen and uh, nutrient pollution to the waterway. They're not all created equal in this standard where you're just going to condemn all septic tanks with one swipe of the brush is neither cost efficient nor backed by scientific research. I think that's a good thing to be made. And then this individual, they, they've been thinking about how we could deal with this, so they propose a five-step. All, all septic tanks get registered, for the most part they probably are. Owner gets a mandatory training, set the frequency of the pumping, report by the pumper when the service is provided, and some sort of low-cost inspection. So there are some things that could be done. Uh, what is the impact of aerobic versus standard septic systems? We've talked about that a lot, uh, but we'll go ahead and are they that much better? So uh, I think what we heard earlier is that definitely in these areas where the state of Florida is working with these folks that are along these spring sites and they're able to retrofit these, these new systems to get the additional treatment, it definitely is better. It just comes with that higher price tag, right? All right, we got three more here and we are almost out of time. So uh, we've got a question here specifically for Mr. Steve Swab regarding reuse water, pros and cons of us employing reuse water on our lawns, plants, etc. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with John on not all septic tanks are created equal and that not all wastewater is either. Um, you've got the two extremes and probably the, the gold standard, like I mentioned, the city of Sarasota here, but there's other plants um, that, that go all the way up to 18 milligrams per liter. So, I think it's unfair to say that the amount of nitrogen that you put out on a golf course and landscape and that concentration isn't somewhat taken up by the landscape and reduced, because I think it is. But I think it's also unfair to think that it's all taken up. When you get up over, I think, 10 milligrams per liter, and this is some of the research I've seen from the University of Florida, they're indicating you're getting to a range where that's more than the landscape can uptake. So what happens to that excess nitrogen? It gets into the soil, it gets into the plants, it gets into the water. The Palmer Ranch tried for, remember Rick, tried for years to figure this out. They got reclaimed water from Sarasota County. They took plant tissue samples, soil samples, reclaimed water, and they were trying to balance how much fertilizer they applied based upon the reclaimed water and all those things, and they just couldn't do it because the reclaimed water concentrations were all over the place. 
you know, that 18 milligrams per liter is an average, but it could be 30 or it could be 10, depending on the time of year and the day. So the one thing that I will say for sure is if the water is AWT and those nitrogen levels are down below three milligrams per liter, it should not be an issue. So that's another advantage of AWT. Not only is it safe to put in the surface water, not only is it more marketable, but it's not adding to the nitrogen problem. I mean, we have a blackout uh, period for fertilizer, but we're, re we're irrigating because we have to. We have to get rid of the reclaimed water with all those nutrients that could be very high nutrients during the blackout period. Nutrient-based blackout period. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's a whole thing that we need to, to be looking at as a community. Thank you, Steve. The first uh, news article that I showed up there was 1910. Anybody want to guess the population of Sarasota in 1910? 840 people. 1979, the year I graduated from high school, 40 years ago, the last month, population 182,000 in Sarasota County. Anybody want to guess what it is right now? It's 400,000 people. So things have changed a little bit. And that's why we got this issue. One of the reasons why we got this issue. So we got two questions here that are very similar. Uh, since it appears we are reaching a critical mass on nitrogen, wastewater, etc., is there any hope the county will place a moratorium on building? <laughs> well, the audience answered the question. <laughs> So what do we do? We put in another 10,000 homes. What the heck? I mean, this is ridiculous. Absolutely. And we're being sold down the river. So uh, someone else asked virtually the same question. Uh, there were two uh, reasons, uh, that, two things that Bill and I talked about when he invited us to come and, and do the little summit. Number one, we knew we couldn't pack seven hours worth of stuff into, you know, an